For commercial satisfaction of demand, they began producing a design over and over and over. Rookwood was in many ways like Camelot. It began with a glorious ideal, began with an intention to create something that had never been created, and then became a victim of itself, of other forces beyond its control, and ended on a sad note, having become an anachronism, having become a passé tradition. Rookwood had women involved in ceramic production, but they were relegated to certain positions Women were considered to be china painters. That was sort of the clean part of the job. But generally, women china painters were not seen as originators of an idea or of a design. Out of that china painting tradition grew an expertise which, of course, wanted to go a step further. There emerged a number of women who distinguished themselves as art potters and not simply china painters. The greatest of them all, I think, would have to be Adelaide Alsop Robineau. <laughs> Dissatisfied as a china painter limited to the stereotype spray of flowers and the inevitable butterfly, Adelaide Alsup Robineau dropped her decorator's brush in 1903 and within eight years became America's first world-renowned potter. Robineau is important for a number of reasons. As I mentioned, she was a china painter, but she very early on became interested in far more than china painting. She was determined to start working in porcelain, which is something most potters feared, porcelain being the hardest of the ceramic bodies to work with. She was obviously driven by a strong motivation to achieve and to achieve the finest quality online with the European ceramicists, and she did. Following a series of lessons written by Taxil Dois, the master potter at the Sèvres Pottery in France, Robineau consolidated her understanding of the complex porcelain making process. Setting up a studio next to her Syracuse home, Robineau embarked on an arduous series of tests with delicate porcelain compounds and crystalline glazes. Every one of the new pieces is warped and blistered, her husband Samuel complained. I have never felt so disgusted and discouraged. I think anybody foolish enough to do porcelains ought to be shut up in an insane asylum. Robineau's work is extraordinary because she was able to take the medium of porcelain and really exploit its finest characteristics. I think the thing we associate most with her is her extraordinary carving. Porcelain's fired at such a high temperature, it becomes extraordinarily hard and can be worked very finely and still retain its strength. So Robineau would carve the porcelain to limits that one could never achieve with coarser bodies. Adelaide Robineau's work was absolutely obsessive. For hours, carving the scarab vase, uh, said to be a thousand hours of work. It's very work and labor intensive. But for her, I think it's a very rewarding experience because it allows her the vehicle to excel in an area where nobody had done so before. Despite Robineau's achievement, perhaps no one fulfilled the ideals of the art pottery movement better than George Orr. Rookwood is a fraud. My name is Mud the unequaled, unrivaled, undisputed greatest potter on earth. You contradict. Orr was one of those strange, idiosyncratic American characters that seemed to emerge, and it did emerge in the 19th century. After learning basic techniques visiting potters throughout the South, George Orr, the mad potter of Biloxi, mastered every facet of ceramics and virtually refashioned them in his own image. Fiercely independent, or dug his own clay out of Mississippi riverbeds, built his own potter's wheel, and invented a variety of glazes that have never been duplicated. Or was just simply idiosyncratic and disagreed with everything that was going on and suddenly saw the medium as one in which he could be very self-expressive. According to the good book, Orr said, we are created from clay, and as nature's had it, no two of us alike. So I make disfigured pottery couldn't and wouldn't make it any other way. I mean, the man was crazy. I mean, wonderfully crazy, you know? He did things to, his, his vessel forms were his takeoff for art. And he would turn them side out and inside out. And nobody would do this. If Orr's pots were art, then their museum was the Biloxi Art and Novelty Pottery. After a visit, critic Lyle Saxon reported that there were shelves filled with pottery, some classic, others distorted, willfully misshapen. Never have you seen work which bore the mark of the maker to such a degree. 
You are holding a teapot beautifully executed, yet you are shocked at the perverse pot next to it. You can hear the potter chuckle as he turned it on the wheel, slapping the face of conventional art. Or has tired of the beautiful and found joy in the bizarre. You find yourself liking the potter immensely. I think Art prided himself on being radical, on pushing clay in ways and means that it had never been exploited before. He tortured his vessels into new shapes. He created glazes that one had not seen before in American ceramic history. And he prided himself on being as bizarre and as outside the norm as possible. He had gigantic moustaches. He would often stand on his head. He was an exhibitionist. And he decided to make some very exhibitionist pottery, pottery that was strange. It was even overtly sexual. So much so, he was teaching at a woman's college, and they fired him because of the sexuality of his pottery. Come on, boy, let's do that mess. Art critics of the day were unimpressed. Mr. Orr suffers from his efforts to make it original at any cost of beauty and aesthetic charm. It is the lack of good proportion, of grace, and of dignity that makes it fail to produce the effect a work of art should. Uninterested in holding a job, unable to stay too long in any one place, or often took his show on the road. Traveling along with exhibitions and carnivals throughout the South, or sought the notoriety he felt he deserved as the unequaled, unrivaled, undisputed, greatest art potter on earth. He never found it. George Orr's importance rests in the fact that he proves a nut can win. Uh, poor George Orr felt terribly neglected, but he achieved what he wanted to uh, about uh, 60 years after his death, unfortunately. Come on, in 1969, the 11,000 pieces that Orr had created for posterity were discovered in the attic of his son's auto shop. Upon seeing Orr's delicate yet structurally sound pots firsthand, many contemporary potters regarded Orr's techniques so sophisticated they considered him the most expert thrower that's ever lived. I am making pots for art's sake, for God's sake, and for future generations. When I am gone, my work will be prized, honored, and cherished. So he comes out of nowhere, not caring what the world thinks, doing what he wants to do. His importance was that he indicated one did not have to be a part of the messy mob in the mud. Cut. Action and reaction. The Industrial Revolution in America was the action. The reaction in America to it was the artistic change, which was the groundwork for modernism in this country. As the 20th century began, the first organizations supporting independent art pottery emerged. At University City, Missouri, Adelaide Robineau, Taxil Dois, and Frederick Reed consolidated their expertise. In 1900, Englishman Charles Fergus Benz founded America's first ceramic department at Alfred University in New York. Benz promoted individual experimentation, yet encouraged potters to share information openly. At Alfred, Benz offered a new sensibility, the notion of the studio potter cooperating with others in order to realize their own personal vision. At the same time came great social upheaval in the country, and Throughout the country, there was a massive move toward the West and California. What the West represented was the idea of paradise achievable, free from technology that the East was overrun with. Open, arid, and undeveloped, California attracted many highly skilled clay artists from the East. And though their depictions of this exotic locale resulted in dramatic imagery, few California art potters succeeded commercially. And as the machine age moved west, independence faced an impossible struggle. Even Frederick Reed, perhaps the consummate designer of his time, returned to industry, remarking that, the artist, however gifted, who attempts to function as an independent is attempting a hopeless job. During the first three decades of the 20th century, the California desert became the domain of a booming commercial industry. 
California became a locus for ceramic production beginning in the late 19th century. Specifically in 1889, Lena Ireland, the wife of the state mineralogist, wrote an article called Pottery in which she advocated that California with its natural clay deposits had the potential to become a major clay producing state on the par with Ohio and New Jersey. In contrast to the rigid practices of the East, California's lack of tradition offered a panacea of creative freedom. And in the 1930s, California would emerge as a new locus for modern clay art, due largely to a potter from Missouri named Glenn Lukens. Determined, rugged, and self-taught, Lukens developed a crude style evoking the privations of the Depression era. And Glenn Lukens, of course, was the beginning class in handmade ceramics here in Southern California. Prior to that, they'd had really basically industrial ceramics, but there wasn't any, there was a very tiny little tradition of handmade clay. We have to understand that in California, in the first half of the 20th century, an inspiring potter wouldn't go to a class and learn all the rudiments of clay making. Most of these artists were self-taught. Glenn Lukens was not very well educated in ceramics. He didn't really have any technical training. So his background was limited. And he, he didn't even have a decent wheel. The only time I saw Lukens demonstrate on the wheel, he used the, an old traditional uh, European style treadle wheel. And of course, another reason he didn't do work on the wheel at that time, he really suffered quite a lot from arthritis. So it was difficult for him to do very much throwing. And this may be another reason why he did mainly uh, hand-built pieces and put uh, so much emphasis on the glazes. He used to take the students out to the desert and they would dig minerals out of the ground, take them back and melt them down, and they became the first kinds of raw mineral glazes that were you know, locally oriented as opposed to just buying them from a glaze company. Lukens is the only one I know of who was doing the, the more individual pieces. His big shallow bowl that had a turquoise glaze in it that would give almost like the effect of water. Lukens's work is wonderful in its dynamic use of glaze, its heavily potted forms. The whole work is about finish and color. They're glorious examples, but at the time they were often seen as mistakes. He writes that his pottery would be uh, rejected by fairs or committees because it appeared to be damaged. But he was searching for clay working uh, that was different from what came before him, that was more robust and dynamic and not as refined. One of the problems with Glenn Lukens was that all the glazes were secret. This was in the 1930s and 40s, at a time when it was difficult for him to get technical information too, so that the things that he discovered on his own, he felt he owned them, and it was hard for him to allow others into his world. So that kind of secrecy was permeated the, the, the ceramic world, partially because people were trying to make a living and they didn't want to give their glazes to anybody else. One of the reasons for that was that if you discovered something, uh, if you created a glaze that was significant, that was how you made your reputation. And if you gave it away, it was no longer yours, or at least that was the thinking. And Lukens himself uh, was so secretive about all the ingredients in his glazes that he locked them in a safe in his ceramic department and he wouldn't let anybody have the key except his assistant. He never let the students glaze their own work. The students would tell him what they wanted in terms of color and he would do the glazing. And the assistant one time when he was gone got in through the safe and they copied the glazes down and discovered after they tried to melt them that he had deliberately left off two or three ingredients, the essential ingredients, so the glazes wouldn't even melt. There's a lot of secretive things happening. Back in the early days, like 
even to the idea of uh, where you got your clay. <laughs> Originally, I thought you got clay at the store. I didn't know, you know. And, and then, where's the store? We're not going to tell you because then you'll know. And uh, where you get that glaze? They're not going to tell you because you'll know. And uh, it was just that closed. Every time I walked through the glaze room to get to the kill room, people have their notebooks open like this, doing their glazes. Then you have these scales out, weighing things, all these weird materials, you know. I thought, yeah, that's weird. I don't know what they're doing in there. But anyway, every time I walked by, they closed their books like this. And they didn't want me to see the secret formula. That was apparently in that book. Anyway, some guy took me to the side one day. He says, I'll show you how to make all the glazes you want in about 10 minutes. And he showed me how to calculate glazes. And I said, oh, there's no secret about this. Who the hell cares? In the post-war era, as Lucan's influence waned, California received an infusion of highly skilled craftsmen immigrating from Europe, resulting in a rebirth of formal and technical concerns. The criteria for the standard of pottery in the 1940s was a, a European aesthetic, again, that was highly influenced by both the Bauhaus and uh, Scandinavian ceramics. And this came out in the work of Laura Andresen and especially Marguerite Wildenhain. In 1919, Marguerite Wildenhain, a young apprentice pottery decorator, became the first woman ever accepted into the Bauhaus pottery in Weimar. Run like a rigorous industrial workshop, the Bauhaus imposed upon its students a strict regimen. Under the supervision of pottery master Max Crahan, Wildenhain spent eight and a half hours a day at the wheel, throwing hundreds of vessels until the techniques became second nature. It's not only that we learn pottery, we learn something about life and how to live. To be a craftsman is also a way of life. That is what we did learn at the Bauhaus, that the craft was only the beginning, it's, it's your handwriting. If you don't have something to say, you might as well stop making it. In 1940, Wildenhain left Germany to escape Nazism, establishing the Pond Farm Arts Collective in Northern California. The disciplined training Wildenhain had received at the Bauhaus would stay with her the rest of her life and helped her become the dominant force in American pottery throughout much of the 1940s and 50s. You see, in the beginning you have to be strict so that they learn all those uh, things that belong into the craft, just like a doctor has to know how to bandage and all that, you know? The talent alone is not going to do it. You need also discipline. Marguerite's methods were really very regimented. She would demonstrate doing a form just like a little cup. So everyone would throw cylinders one after another and then pick out one piece that you'd consider the most perfect one. So then the next day, make a taller cylinders. And the idea was to get that as perfect as possible. So you'd pick out just one of those, and everything else would go back into the scrap clay. And probably the most complex piece was to make a teapot. So you'd make a row of teapots, and then save just one. And this would take up a whole summer. It's hard to believe, but you made a lot of pots. The criteria was perfection of form. If you threw one pot or a hundred pots, they had to be perfect in form. And yet, even while that was the ideal, things were beginning to change toward other interests. Because after you've thrown a hundred pots that are absolutely perfect, all you can do then is be imaginative about the surface. And certainly artists were at that time, but it was limiting. So there had to be something else happening. Uh, some other idea had to come into play. I think when I was going to graduate school down here, I went up to see her one time, and she read her little treatise and little paper that sounded all well and good, real Bauhaus. But when you have a heavy German accent, anything sounds great. And if you read it on a piece of